Hello and welcome to this week's Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I hope you're having a wonderful week. I've had had quite a nice week. Um, I want to apologize to each and every one of you. I, I haven't been able to update the TikTok or the Instagram accounts as often as I would like. But thankfully, that was because of my wonderful week. Uh, my my mother in law came up to visit, as I mentioned as I mentioned last week, and had had a wonderful time with her. She is an absolutely lovely woman. I'm so thankful to have gotten to meet her. That also, between going to work and and taking care of my mother-in-law and everything, it was a wonderful time, but it was a hectic time. Uh, those of you that are married out there or in committed relationships, I think you'll get what I mean. Hopefully this week, I'll be able to really update the that TikTok that Instagram account more often. I've got a few stories lined up for that that I can't wait to share with you. Keep your eye out for those. Our first case is going to take us all the way back to November 9th, 1974, Vancouver. Now, it's nighttime, and in her kitchen stands Dorothy Isaac. She cannot shake the feeling that someone is watching her. You ever have that? I have. Like that that weird tingle on the back of your neck. You can feel eyes on you. Dorothy is going through that right now. She looks around. Looks out her window. And that's whenever Dorothy sees... A diamond-shaped object in the sky. Now, the 1970s, Vancouver, British Columbia in general, there had been a lot of reports of lights in the night sky. A lot of them. But this was the first night that Dorothy saw any lights. Once again, I, I, I talk about this all the time. If a family member, a friend comes to you, please take them seriously. Talk to them if, if they've seen something like this. Because you know what? Dorothy's family did not take her seriously. Dorothy <laughs> seems like, quite honestly, a woman after my heart. Dorothy decides to go out and prove She decides to go out and prove that she's seeing these things. She takes her flashlight and tries to contact the lights. She'll flash three times to the right, and then the object will travel to the right. She flashes three times to the left. The object will travel to her left. It's responding Dorothy goes they're trying to communicate so she decides to get them on film she gets her camera a movie camera and begins to film in the video there are several balls of light All kind of flying in the same direction. But every once in a while, there's like these bright flashes on the screen. She has a home viewer. So she inches the film forward, trying to get to those frames where the flashes were. And instead of just like one bright white frame, she sees multicolored streaks, lines, 
moving in several directions on the film. She begins to believe that these lines were an attempt at communication by the objects. In some of these pictures, we're talking just balls of light. Some of them are fuzzy. Some of them you can see a vague shape. But a few of them, a few of them are quite amazingly defined. One bears more than a passing resemblance to the Baltic Sea anomaly, which I, I kind of find interesting. Dorothy, over the years, uses at least three different cameras. And each camera records the same thing. Very similar balls of light, very similar trails, very similar objects. Dorothy becomes really, really well known through the mid-70s and the 1980s. She becomes well known for her very odd photographs. Uh, there was there was one UFO investigator. I, I tried to find out this gentleman's name or lady's name. Could not find it. But they they go to Dorothy's home. And he begins to have this weird sensation. Almost a hum. It's in his right ear. Dorothy can hear it too. Within a, a minute of hearing these sounds, both of them go out and they see a bright metal object in the sky. Dorothy ended up getting over 25 hours of film. She went out and made, made blow ups of the, of the film so that she could have still pictures three thousand frames have been blown up now of course something like this people are going to start to think you're a little odd because that's society a psychologist goes examines dorothy the psychologist comes back and goes this woman's telling the truth i don't know I don't know if what are in the, in the photographs are actually UFOs, which is a ridiculous statement to make because they're in the sky and you can't tell what they are. That, by definition, is UFOs. You, pe people think UFOs mean alien craft. No. UFOs are UFOs. I do like, I do like the rebranding into UAP. But UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are UFOs. If, if I throw a paint can across the sky and somebody looks at it, that's a UFO. If they can't figure out what it is, it stops being a UFO the moment it hits the ground. They go, oh, it's a paint can. But most of, most of the paint cans that I throw, not that I throw a ton of paint cans, most of the ones that I throw don't teleport, zoom off, abduct people. There's something going on. We can all agree on that. I think, I think most of us can agree on that. I need to watch my words. Because obviously we can't agree on that as a society. Even though it's, it's damn obvious that's what's happening. Uh, be that as it may, be that as it may, the, the psychologist does not believe that these were alien craft, but he also doesn't believe that Dorothy was faking them either. He believes their natural phenomena, which, okay, okay. A lot of you, a lot of you are probably sitting back going, Wow, this, this sounds really, really familiar. And you're probably right. If you're anything like me, you grew up on Unsolved Mysteries. 
December 12th, 1990, Unsolved Mysteries did an episode about Dorothy. She and the cameraman both filmed the sky with their cameras. Now, the Unsolved Mysteries cameraman, nothing showed up in that film. But some stuff did show up in, in, in Dorothy's film. Make of that what you may. Sadly, Dorothy Mary Isaac passed away January 29th, 2021. And we, we lost something amazing. We lost someone amazing. And my condolences go out to her friends and family. I, I would have loved to have met the woman, quite honestly. Our next tale takes us all the way back to October 1901. We're on the 160-acre farm of Gus and Molly Burgess between Yorktown and Daleville, Indiana. W.H. Blodgett, who is a veteran writer for the Indianapolis News. He's, he's at this farm. He was, he, he, was, he was traveling around looking for stories. He was very interested in Hoosier folklore. And, and he was playing cards one night with another reporter. And he tells him, you, you need... You need to see this house, this extremely haunted house. Now, Gus, whose, whose real name was Charles Augustus, Gus and Molly, they were in their 20s, and they, they lived in this old farmhouse with a, with a six-year-old boy, Peyton. Been living there since Peyton was born six years earlier. They tell Blodgett that there were two other tenants. They hadn't stuck around. One, one they said, moved into the house one day and left the next day. Which, never a good sign. They tell Blodgett there's, you know, there's odd things going on. There's a Native American graveyard located close by. They would, they would plow the fields. And every once in a while, they would dig up arrowheads, uh, other tools, bones. This apparently was a pretty common thing. Central Indiana farmers back in this time would sometimes keep barrels full of bones that, that come up out of their fields or would happen to, to fall out of of Native American mounds, sometimes even in the hollows of trees. As Blodgett investigates, he, he finds out there are actually two big legends that happened on or near the Burgess's farm. The first was about this Native American chief, the fox. Uh, his, his real name was Wasehito. Now, Wasehito had traded with white pioneers in his, in his wigwam. And he had $5,000 in gold. Now, Wasehito dies in a wolf hunt. And after he dies, the gold mysteriously disappears. I don't think there was anything paranormal about that gold disappearing. I think it was probably white hands taking that gold. Now, there were a lot of seances on the grounds. People trying desperately to find this lost gold. A lot of people thought it was, it was hidden uh, near this huge rock that happened to be close to a river that went by the, the property, the white river. <sighs> the, the ghost of Wasehito though, for, for whatever reason, it turns into a headless horseman legend. He would ride out over the area of farms. He would go through barn doors, sometimes coming up out of the soil itself. Now there's another ghost 
there's another ghost, another legend on the property, Dr. George Washington Slack. Now, Dr. Slack had come from, uh, come from Pennsylvania in the 1830s as a 12-year-old child. He studied at Rush Medical College in Chicago, and then, and then he went on to practice medicine in Yorktown. He was very well known. He had eight children that lived in the house with him. Slack died January of 1886, 60. He was 60 years old. Unfortunately, Dr. Slack's mind became unsettled as he aged. One night, he goes out into the yard and shoots himself. The wound does not kill him. The blood's pouring out of his body. He goes into the house, walks up the stairs to a little room in the northwest corner, takes a knife, and cuts his own throat. The stain was still there. The stain was still there. It could not be brought up. But he still didn't die there. He's found. He's taken to the hospital. That's where he dies. What, what sadness has to infect a man? What, what depression or terror or just hate for oneself has to infect a man that he's, he's willing to do that to himself? I think it's at this point that I have to take a break from this. I've I've had a lot of friends commit suicide. And if I'm being totally honest, I've come close myself. Come very close myself. I I need everyone who might be feeling that way to hear me right now. Just take a moment and listen. If you think the sadness is going to end, you're wrong. All that suicide accomplishes is taking that sadness and passing it on to the people that care about you the most and amplifying it a thousandfold. Do me a favor. Do me a personal favor. If you're having thoughts like this, please go get help. Here's a great place to start. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 800-273-8255. That number again, 1-800-273-8255. It's important enough, a third time, 1-800-273-8255. I know sometimes it seems like no one cares. I know it seems like sometimes it's not going to get better. And I'm here to tell you that it is, that it does, that people do care and I care. So please, if you need it, go get the ha- go get that help for me. Because I know there's at least one person that cares about you and you're hearing his voice right now. I care about each and every one of you. Now, it's it's sometime later that people start to hear noises coming from that room. That room upstairs where Dr. Slack did those horrible things to himself. They hear groans, something rolling over the floor. Music, violin music. They've heard people laugh. They've heard footsteps coming down the stairs, but no one is ever seen on the stairs. The door between the dining room and the kitchen will not stay shut. It swings open at all hours for no reason whatsoever. No matter how it's fastened, it will swing open. Another cupboard 
where the doctor, where the doctor, Doctor Slack, kept his medicine. It it keeps swinging so much that they have to take it off the hinges. A, a former resident, uh, a Mister Bill Fouquet, he saw the ghost of Doctor Slack in the room and shot at it. There's bullet holes in the woodwork. Another another uh, tenant, Tom McKinley, he moved. He was the he was the gentleman that moved in one day and got out the next. He he couldn't stand the noises. He saw the ghost standing where the stove was. The Burgesses tried desperately to remove the blood stain. Strong lie, but they could not get it out. Whenever Mr. Burgess is being interviewed, they ask him, have you ever seen the Headless Horseman? Let's, let's get away from the ghost of Dr. Slack. Have you ever seen the Headless Horseman? Mr. Burgess said, yeah, I've shot at him. I've never been able to hit him. He rides a sort of dark horse, just like the doctor used to ride. Ah, interesting, right? Like the doctor used to rise. And he's sort of thin and misty-like and he has no head. He generally starts at the barn, but I've seen him out in the road. There in front of the house. Sometimes he just seems to bob up out of the ground. Lots of people have had their horses shy at him. And he was riding around people who were driving along the road. It's not very often that he gets far away from the house. And then he just disappears and no one knows what becomes of him. I'm not the only one that has shot him but no one's ever been able to hit him. See, that, that to me is interesting. Like a lot of people, a lot of people attribute that headless horseman to, to, the, to the Native American man. Who's, I'm, I'm going to be honest, his name escapes me right now. I'm going to have to go back in my notes, and I'm afraid if I put my cards down, I'm not going to be able to get back to them. I, I believe it was Wasehito was, was the Native American's name. But I really think this is all the doctor. I really think this is all the doctor. But with all the sounds, all the, all the weird noises... This, this house becomes known as the House of Gibbering Ghosts. After interviewing the Burgesses, W.H. Blodgett slept pretty easy that night. Until the wee hours, whenever he was awakened by an unearthly noise in his neighboring bed, he had a traveling companion, a fellow ghost hunter named Dick. Dick had started choking, gurgling, gasping, and he was able to wake up Blodgett with a muffled call for help. Blodgett goes over, shakes him awake, calms Dick down. Dick looks at him and goes, I guess I had the nightmare. He says, I thought a ghost without a head on a headless horse was chasing me. It made me jump over a high cliff. Just as I struck, a fellow in all white was trying to crowd three fingers down my throat. Our last tale takes place either in 1948 or 1955. It's uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Time is time is one of those things that I think is becoming very. Very interesting in both the paranormal aspect and the scientific aspect. It's one of those rare, rare subjects that I think that science and the paranormal can both agree. Time is not as rigid as we thought. Science, science will tell us that the faster we move, the faster we move, the slower time moves for us. This is no longer a theory. This has been proven. 
This has been proven whenever we get up to amazing speeds, such as spacecraft launches. They'll take synchronized atomic clocks, leave one here on Earth, another one shoots out into space. Whenever that one returns, there is a minute, a minute difference in the time that is completely measurable. Time does not work in all locations at all speeds the same. You get into a high gravity situation with, let's say, a black hole. At one point, the closer you get to it, time's going to seem to cease being, which for me is terrifying. Could you imagine spending an eternity staring at a black hole, knowing that you're waiting for a demise that is sure to happen, but may take, may take thousands of years, but to you, it's going to be a blink of an eye. That's terrifying. But are there other instances where time does not behave the way time should. Let's talk about Charles W. Ingersoll of Cloquette, Minnesota. I did a little bit of research on Charles. He honestly seems like the kind of guy I, I would have loved to have known. Had a, if, if it's the same Charles W. Ingersoll, and I can't imagine there are that many Charles W. Ingersolls in Cloquette, Minnesota, he seemed to love old radio, and that's a passion of mine, too. I love, and I mean love, like the old Jack Benny shows. And uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is a big favorite of mine. The Great Gildersleeves. I love old radio. Life of Riley. Burns and Allen. Just Arch Obler's Lights Out. You want scary... Look into Arch Obler's Lights Out. Go find a couple of episodes of that. It's like a proto-Twilight Zone. Magnificent stuff. But Charles Ingersoll, he, he wanted to see the Grand Canyon. He had planned it for years. And it seemed like in 48, they would finally get to go. But life happens. The trip is postponed. And finally, in 1955, Charles Ingersoll and his family, they're finally able to make the trip. They put it off for seven years. And everything, everything was impressive. I mean, it's the Grand Canyon. If you haven't been, make the time. I haven't been out there since the mid-80s. But it is... It's breathtaking. It's, it's soul-shaking, breathtakingly beautiful. And Charles is looking at this, and he's saying, I, I wish I would have brought a movie camera. Now, he doesn't have a movie camera, but he does very cautiously go out to the edge of the canyon and he takes a picture using his 35 millimeter camera 10 days later 10 days pass they're back home in minnesota charles goes you know what i'm not going to let that happen again i'm going to go get a movie camera i'm going to go get a projector too I'm going to get this movie camera, this projector, and that way, if I'm ever in this situation again, I'll have the equipment I need to really preserve this memory. So he goes to a local photo store. That's, that's whenever he notices, hey, there's, there's a film of the Grand Canyon here that I can purchase. It's... It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. I will get to have some film of the Grand Canyon. 
This is a travel log of the Grand Canyon put out by Castle Films in 1948. Charles gets home. He's excited. He's excited. He has these he has these films from from the Grand Canyon. He's got he's got film of his own. He's got the camera. He's got the projector. He sets it up. And that's whenever time broke. The entire family watched the film from 1948 and sees Charles in the film. Walks over to the rim of the canyon, takes out his 35 millimeter camera and takes the picture. A film made seven years before the Ingersolls went to the canyon. There's Charles taking out his 35 millimeter camera. Now, Ingersoll, Charles Ingersoll himself, he goes, I have shown this movie to many people, not informing them that the footage reveals my picture. And they all say, there's Charlie. Did you take that picture? Skeptics say that I had the film made up after I arrived home from the trip. That's not possible as not even a week passed from the time we left the Grand Canyon to the day I bought the film. The possibility of the film being added to is out as the quality of the film is the same and subject to the closest scrutiny. In addition, the dealer would testify that this particular reel of footage in the Castle film series has been on the shelf for well over a year. I tried to find... I tried to find the travelogue. I tried to find the video, and I'm still going to be searching for it. It does seem that Castle Films put out two travelogues on the Grand Canyon. They were under the World Parade line. Grand Canyon and Grand Canyon Grandeur. There's... If somebody has an 8mm camera, they're still available through an 8mm distributor. They're $15 each. I would love to see them. It wouldn't do for me to order them. I don't have an 8mm projector. Wouldn't even know where to get one. I'm sure that they're available. But man, if that film could be located, it's one of them. It's one of them from Castle Films. It's either Grand Canyon or Grand Canyon Grandeur. If that film could be located, if we could find the image of Charles leaning over the rim to snap a photo with a 35mm camera, and here's the hook. The camera that Charles would be holding in the film would probably be a 1955 model. This may be lost media, but if this is lost media that could be located, this could be proof the time slips are real. The time is not as solid as we think. I mean, really ponder it. If you walk out your door and walk out to your car, you could blip into last week or a week from now and then blip right back. Would you even notice? My sidewalk isn't that different from week to week. And even if it was, I would look down and go, oh, huh. There is the, the, the missing object phenomena. The, mo- the most famous aspect of it is whenever you set your car keys down, You go back to find them. They're not there. You hunt all over the place. You go back again to where you thought they were and they were there. Maybe it's not anything paranormal moving the keys. Maybe it's not a Mandela effect. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you going through a time slip. Going to a time 
whenever those keys aren't there. Or maybe it just didn't look hard enough. Thank you once again for joining us here on Strange Pathways. If you'd like to get in touch with me, strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. I got an interesting email this week from Nero. Uh, I I know that's not your real name, so I'm going to feel comfortable giving that out. Please get back to me. I am very, very interested about what you call the incident. I want to hear more about this. Please get back to me. Head on over to Facebook. We're going to have images from the cases that we talked about this week. Go over to TikTok, Instagram, Strange Pathways Podcast on both of those. Be sure to go over to YouTube. Hit hit like, comment, subscribe. Hit that bell for the notifications. It really does help. Get out there. Tell your friends. Post on on forums let them know that there is this great podcast called strange pathways that you're enjoying and you think that they'll enjoy it too and i do want to thank each and every one of you for being here with me this week i'm going to try to get those those videos up more often on tiktok and instagram for you this week hopefully things have calmed down in my life that i can do that but as always please take care of yourself and each other (laughs) 